Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Burlington House. We're delighted to be back here delivering our lecture program. And this is the first hybrid event. We're, and we're delighted to welcome so many of you here, but online as well. And I understand there's well over 100 people online. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to briefly tell you a little bit about the society in case anyone is new. Uh, we were founded in 1707, uh, famously at a meeting in a pub, the Bear Tavern, for the purpose of investigating and debating material remains of the past found in Britain. We were awarded a royal charter by George III in 1751 and charged with the encouragement, advancement and furtherance of study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. At the same time, we were given rooms in Somerset House, shared with the Royal Society, and that allowed us to house and care for our growing library and museum collection, and hold meetings for fellows to discuss and debate their research into the material past. We then moved here to Burlington House in 1874, where we continued to focus on fellowship, conservation, research, and dissemination of our work. Today, we remain focused on those core objectives, and as a registered charity, we're committed to sharing our collections and our work with the public, which we do through public lectures like this one today, public tours, exhibitions, scholarly, scholarly research seminars, and a program of publications. So before I introduce today's lecturer, a little bit of housekeeping, there will be a question and answer session at the end. We'll be taking questions from the room, and on Zoom and YouTube. If anyone would like to ask a question online, please type it in the chat function on Zoom and YouTube. And I will ask as many as we can at the end of the lecture. For those in the room, please just raise your hand as normal. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker and his lecture today, Fighting Caesar, Britons in Gaul and Gauls in Britain in Caesar's Battle for Gaul by Andrew Fitzpatrick, FSA. Andrew is an archaeological consultant and honorary research fellow at Leicester University. He worked in commercial practice for many years, uh, leading several large projects that yielded a series of standout discoveries, the best known of which is the Copper Age burial known as the Amesbury Archer. And his project teams won two British archaeological awards. As well as publishing the results of that fieldwork in research monographs, Andrew has published widely on the later prehistory of Britain and Western Europe, and particularly on the Iron Age, including a paper on the type site of La Ten in a recent volume of the Antiquaries Journal. His talk today is about the Iron Age and springs from a research project undertaken with Leicester University on Julius Caesar's expeditions to Britain and the long-term consequences of them. Andrew has served on the Council, Executive and Research Committee of the Society. Thank you, Andrew. Over to you. Thank you, Heather. I want to start with a proposition and to finish with a question. And the proposition is that sometimes, but very rarely, we can see individuals who are involved in some of the great events of written history. And the picture that you can see now is an image of that man who lived just over 2000 years ago and whose grave was found near North Burstead, close to Chichester on the south coast of England. Much of what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is to work through in detail the evidence that we can unpick from the burial of a man and also the objects of his mourners placed in the grave with them. But from that small compass of a grave, I hope to move wider and to look at historical context in which I think we can argue that this man lived and died. Much of the work that I'll be talking about has been undertaken in parallel with an exhibition at the Novian Museum in Chichester that is still running until the middle of next month. And a lot of what I have to say today has never been seen in public before because it's been done in association with the museum. But let me turn to the proposition. What can we see of individuals in history? 
Well, I want to start with Julius Caesar's comment that was written very probably in the year 55 BC. And in it, he explains why he chose to come to Britain. Firstly, for a short expedition and for a longer expedition the following year. And he said, Caesar was intent upon starting for Britain. He understood that in almost all the Gallic campaigns, succors had been furnished for our enemy from that quarter. In other words, the Britons had helped the Gaul in their battle against him. Now, we have some evidence for the great support that Caesar describes. It comes primarily from coins, which are found on both sides of the channel. And it's quite plausible that these coins were made to pay for soldiers traveling from Britain to fight in Gaul. And some of them will have been brought back by people returning or by refugees. But what are the individuals who use these coins? So when we see a picture like this, which is a, a map of all the finds of gold coins of a certain type about the size of a modern one pound coin, we can see they're found across Northern France and Belgium and well across much of Southern and Eastern England. Now these coins are issued from perhaps 80 BC onwards and there's a long and complex history, but in the little diagram on the slide, the scale on the bottom shows the weight. And what happens over time is that the coins get lighter, there's less gold in them. And the scale on the left is a number of coin dies which are used to make it. And this is where the coins are literally made by hammering together two stamps. And circled in red is a huge increase in dies from around 500 individual dies to 1,500. And so it's thought that these coins were made at a time when an awful lot of money was needed. And it's much debated, the finer chronology of these coinages, but at least some, probably many, were used by people who fought Caesar. Now the focus in the study of these coinages or coinages of this time is traditionally in this area across the channel, but it's not the only area of Gaul that had links with Britain. Much less well-known are the coins that come from the Lower Seine Valley and in Normandy, and which are found around the Solent, particularly in West Sussex and Hampshire, and then into Dorset. And these coins of the tribe, or attributed to the tribe, the Beocassis, are something that I'm going to return to later on. But let us turn to the area around the Solent, in particular around Chichester. In the bottom of this drawing, you can see Selzyville. And next to the label West Hampnet is the location of modern Chichester. But 2,000 years ago, Chichester was yet to begin. And I just picked three sites to talk about briefly to give you a feel for what we know of the archaeology of this time just over 2,000 years ago. The Trundle is a hill fort, West Hampnet is a burial ground, and North Thursted is the grave that I intend to discuss in detail. So high above the West Sussex coastal plain overlooking it near Goodwood the Racecourse is the Trundle. It's unusual in that it's a hill fort that continues to this time because over the preceding centuries, many mighty forts had fallen out of disuse. And indeed, the Trundle does not long last beyond the end of the first century BC, but it would have been occupied at the time that this man lived. And people lived typically in the well-known feature of the British Iron Age, their circular houses, and here a reconstruction from the uh, Butts ancient farm, but also a site plan of the Lavant Reservoir just below the Trundle, where you can see the many roundhouses and the square buildings that were used to store grain. Very important for our present purposes is the cemetery at West Hampnet. This was occupied or used between about 120 BC to about 40 BC, and it has 160 graves in it. And what's particularly important here is that none of the burials are inhumations, they are all cremation burials, and none of the graves contain weapons. And this is a contrast with what we'll see later. West Hampton is the first 
Iron Age cremation burial cemetery. It must be introduced by new religious beliefs coming from Gaul in the second century BC. And the style of pottery that you see here, particularly the tall vases, but also the brooches that were put on the pyre with the dead people, all have strong links to Upper Normandy and the same. So in the first century BC, we have a good feel for the archeology span of the area around Chichester. And it's an area that is particularly coming to be intensively settled. The coastal plain, which is low lying and liable to flooding is gradually being drained. We see field boundaries being put in to assist with drainage. And it's in the context of the excavation of what was initially a quite ordinary looking Iron Age settlement and associated field systems and paddocks that the burial at North Bestwick was found. And here you see a typical example of archeology span taken in advance of development. You can see uh, a whole mass of little lines with the trial trenches that are dug with a mechanical digger, uh, trying to assess where further work may be needed. And you can see from the myriad of black lines that indeed further excavation was merited before a new housing estate was built and this work was undertaken by Thames Valley Archaeological Services and I'd like to acknowledge the great assistance that they've given me in the work that I'm talking about today. If we zoom in to the first century BC and the top right hand corner, the northeast corner of the development site, we're just going to look at only pieces of evidence that date to around the first century BC and you can see there are many ditches and paddocks and scattered in and between and amongst these fields are a few houses. But to everybody's surprise, in one area, a grave was found. And there was nothing to single out this grave. It doesn't have a large barrow over it. It's not marked by a ditch, but it had one of the most remarkable graves of the first century BC, not just in Britain, but in Western Europe. And I first became aware of this grave when one of the archeologists who was supervising the work for the local planning authority sent me an email with a picture rather like this saying, do you know what these iron bars across this grave is or what are? To which my answer was a very helpful, no idea. But you can see a small compass of the grave here. The four bars across and at the head of the grave to the left, three tall vases like the ones in the cemetery at West Hampton. And in the center, we'll see this in more detail, a bronze helmet and a bronze shield boss. By the man's feet, you can't see the skeleton at this stage in the excavation, the remains of some props that have deliberately been broken. And when the bars were finally removed, we were left with the burial of a man who was about five foot three, so not particularly tall, he died between the ages of 30 to 45. So he lived well into his adulthood, but he didn't live to a ripe old age. We can tell from Kerry Fallis' work on the human bones that he survived episodes of anemia and probably malnutrition as a child and as an adult. He also had osteoarthritis in his back. But the muscles and ligature re remains on his or marks on his bones indicate that He'd led a very active life. The marks on his legs suggest that he may have ridden a horse and certainly he'd done a lot of heavy work with his right arm. So we could see a little bit of the individual already. Now, the DNA of this man is in the process of being published and we hope that it'll be in a, a paper in nature in the coming months. Um, but I can't say too much about that because I'm not allowed to, uh, and I don't understand it terribly well either, but that's another story. But we can say a little bit more about where the man came from. In the report that was published in 2014 by Andy Taylor and his colleagues at Thames Valley Archaeological Services, there was a first attempt at looking at the isotopes to try and establish where the man had spent his childhood. And initially, it was thought it might be quite far in the south of France. And that's because as we grow up, we lock in a chemical fingerprint in our teeth. 
of the drinking water, which is susceptible to the temperature, and also the rocks below our feet through which the, the soils and then the plants and then into ourselves give a chemical signature of what we're eating. The important thing on this map that shows the broad contours essentially of heat in water as we go from west to east is that the man buried at North Burstead isn't from the south coast of England. He's in this pale green area. And so it's possible he was brought up in England further north of the Sussex Downs, but more likely, I will argue, somewhere in France, running down from Belgium right to the south coast of France. So he's an incomer to the place that he's buried. But let's look a little bit more at the objects that his mourners buried alongside him. Now the iron bars that we saw in the first photograph have now been removed. And so the plan here shows what's on the base of the grave. And so the red dots around the sides of the grave are at the feet of the iron bars, apart from one at the head where there was a bar at the base and at the top. So you see the skeleton is laid out in an extended position, the three pots by his head, the broken pots by his feet. And you make out the curved red line. That's an, an iron sword that's been deliberately bent at the time of burial. And the blue marks show a helmet and some crests that were placed next to the helmet and a shield boss. And I want to look at these objects in turn. So here are the pots, which are actually very elegant. If you go to the museum before the middle of November, you'd be surprisingly impressed by their elegance. But I just want to pick out on the similarities to the cemetery at West Hamlet. Now, in the course of the footsteps of Caesar project at Leicester, we undertook a radiocarbon determination on the burial, which was on the previous slide. And that has come out a little bit earlier than we would have anticipated according to the dates we would assign to the objects. And that is consistently the case in all of the radiocarbon dates that will be on the next few slides and hereafter. I, I don't understand that either. All I can say is there's work to be done to explain it. But here, for example, is in yellow, one of the pots from North Burstead, very similar to one of the graves from West Hamlet. And if we look, for example, at two of the jars, they're again, very similar to some of the ones at West Hamlet. Now these little bowls rather, are copies of pots that were imported from Brittany. Now, none of the pots in the cemetery at West Hamlet or in the grave at North Burstead are imports, but the imported vessels have been found at a settlement just a kilometer away. So we know that they are available, but they're not choosing to place those imports in the graves. And interestingly, the pots at the foot of the grave had been deliberately smashed. And when West Hamlet was excavated, one of the things that was noticed that in the pyre sites, there was often a pot that had been deliberately smashed as the final use of the pyre. And so there are similarities between the rituals in the cremation burial at West Hamlet, just five kilometers away from North Burstead, and also with the inhumation burial. So we return to the iron bars. Now, I was puzzled. I scratched my head and really came up with no answer until uh, attention to the technicians at the back, something's just popped up. Um, for a variety of reasons, it wasn't possible to uh, have all the metalwork fully conserved and illustrated in the course of the excavation report. And so it's on this screen. I'm happy to turn it off, but I think it's better for someone responsible does so. Okay. It hadn't been possible to have the ironwork fully conserved. And this didn't happen until the work on the exhibition was due to start. And uh, the Nobia Museum in Chichester is very fortunate to have, as one of its volunteers, Jackie Watson, 
uh, very fine conservative who worked for what was English heritage at the time for many years, but who now volunteers. And Jackie looked at the replaces, replaced wood, the mineral replaced remains of the wood attached to the ironwork. And she could unpick some of the clues. And it told us that we were essentially looking at an open box of what we'd have been seeing on the top of the grave is the base. And there are a couple of sides and there was one end. And I was still puzzled until eventually I realized the only thing that it could be is something like this. Now, this is a reconstruction of a, a cart or chariot burial in Yorkshire several hundred years earlier, but it's something that we see in Britain and, of course, all across Europe. So by the time we get to the first century BC, the right of burying chariots in Yorkshire has passed. And in continental Europe, although we still see chariots placed in graves, it's often just pieces of the chariot. They've been deliberately dismantled and only a few parts are put in the grave. So if we look at the site plan of the Wetwang village burial, you can see the inhumation burial tucked up in yellow at the bottom of the picture and the wheels of the chariot above it. But if we then color in where the remains of the wooden box were found, we look at something like that. And so if we move along to North Burstead and look at the red dots, which represent the edges of the iron bars and put a red box around it. It is something like that. It is without parallel. And I think in real terms, I can show you one of my holiday snaps. We're looking at something like that. There was considerable dismay amongst my family when I disappeared down an alley going, oh, isn't yeah. that interesting? To which the answer was no. If it is the remains of a vehicle and it's just the box, no suspension, no wheels, it will be the only one of its type in southern England. But let's turn to look at some of the other objects. And the man was buried with a panoply of weapons. And this is a shield boss, but it's wafer thin. It's less than a millimeter thick. And it's bent on one side, but that's probably through um, damage that's happened in the course of the grave, slowly collapsing over thousands of years. There are only a couple of examples like this in England. Well, in fact, there's one in England and three in France. And one of the French one comes from near Soissons, but the other two come from the battlefield site of Elysia, which was where the decisive battle of the war in Gaul was fought in 52 BC. By the man's head, the spearhead was placed. Now the shaft had clearly been broken in order to place the spear there. So it had been deliberately destroyed. And the same is true of the iron sword. It's been deliberately bent. Now, the tip is, we have located the tip, it wasn't found when it, the object was conserved. So the, the end is actually present, but the sword and scabbard have been deliberately bent round. And that is something that isn't very common in England at all, but is very common in France. And there are only two or three finds of this type of sab scabbard in England. And it's dated very accurately to between about 80 and 50 BC. So it's a, in probability something that has come from France, or at least from people who knew what weaponry was current in France at that time. And if we just turn to look at the, the range of other finds, I've marked them in red here. And there are only a very small number of burials in the south of England that date to the first century BC. A couple nearby, uh, one St. Lawrence on the Isle of Wight, another one of Oslebury near Winchester, and one further north in Essex at Kelverden. And I just want to look at some of those other similar finds. So if we look at the one from Oslebury, excavated by John Collis, it's the one that has in the grave the bronze shield boss. 
Now, it's quite possible that the one in the grave at North Burstead is tinned. So work that Eric Nordgren and students at West Dean College near Chichester have been doing has included X-ray fluorescence analysis, and it looks like the object has a tin decoration. We don't know whether the one at Oswaldbury was or not. But interestingly, if you look at the layout of the grave, it's not dissimilar from North Burstead, but the sword hasn't been bent, and indeed the sword is a typically British type, and the spearhead may well have been broken because the iron end, the ferrule, is found halfway up the grave. But it doesn't show, or the mourners didn't dismantle and break the objects in the way that the mourners at North Burstead did. In contrast, Kelvin and Essex, this was done. Now, we don't know whether this was a cremation burial or an inhumation burial because it was a chance discovery. And it's only brought to publication after much hard work by Paul Seeley, who's in the audience today. And Paul Seeley noticed, firstly, the sword had been deliberately bent, but the scabbard had a strip of tin running along it for decorative purposes. The spearhead is extraordinarily long. It's about this big, and it too had been deliberately bent. And partly because of the similarities of this spearhead to ones in France, Paul Seeley suggested that the person buried at Kelvin might have fought in the war in Gaul. And also in the bottom of the picture, another shield boss, in this case in iron, but, but that is by far the most common variety in Gaul. But these three bosses from Winchester, uh, Oswaldbury and Winchester, Kelverden and North Burstead are really the only ones from Britain. But then we turn to one of the other puzzles, the bronze open work, sheet work that was placed next to the helmet. I didn't know what this was either at the time of discovery. We can be clear about what the type of helmet is. It's what's known as a coolest type helmet. And it's uh, very well known in France in the first century BC. And there's only one other find in Britain, in this case from Kent Bridge near Canterbury. And if we look at a, the distribution map of these helmets, it's very much centered in Gaul. And for many years, there was an argument, are they Roman helmets or are they Celtic helmets? But we can now see that these helmets aren't found in Iberia where Rome fought many wars. They're not found in Asia Minor where Rome fought many wars in the 60s and 50s BC. So I think we can be confident that this is an Iron Age helmet, a Gaulish helmet, and in all probability, the ones at Bridge and the ones at North Burstead are imported. But what of the sheet work? Now, when we started work on the exhibition, there's a small group of um, colleagues helping the museum and uh, Melanie Giles and Julia Farley uh, sat alongside me and we shared our mutual ignorance on this. But I said, well, I think it's likely to be something like either a standard or a carnic. So the standard, the one here from Sulak Sumer is about 40 centimeters long. And essentially it is a pig on a stick that you carry into battle. And in many ways, the Carnix is a very similar uh, idea. In this case, there are war trumpets and one of the, uh, the Carnique from Tintignac, also in the Southwest of France, its main is represented in an open work style. And this open work is very much something that we see in France and it isn't something that we see in Britain. And so the work continued in the laboratory. And so we were able to see what the crests looked like. And they're about um, 350 uh, millimeters long, and so about that big. And we began to realize that the little objects that sit below this crest uh, had something to do with how the object was attached. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the decoration on uh, the sheet work, but suffice to say, it's, it's essentially there are four fields of compass-based decoration. The, the layout either side of the center is broadly symmetrical, but not precisely so. And over the top, there is a running scroll, uh, a wave-like pattern that's very typical of late 
Celtic art of the first century BC. And the second crest is similar, but was mounted in a different way. And having worked this out, the objects were then sent to the conservation laboratory to start preparing them for display. And it's at this point that James Kenny, of Chichester District Council, and Amy Roberts, the curator at the Novium, who's been a fantastic assistant to me throughout, the two of them realized that on the helmet there were a series of solder marks, little circles of silver color. And it was at that point we realized that the little objects weren't, as had first been thought, some form of pendant, but actually supports that sat on the top of the helmet. And so Amy Roberts and I went right back to the conservation records that the conservator had made as they micro excavated the block of soil in the laboratory. And we were able to piece it together. But none of that prepared me for what came back from the model that was made for the exhibition. Some sight. Now, in Britain in the Iron Age, there is a fine array of wonderful and different looking headgear. And I just want to give you one example, in this case, from a, a burial of the mid first century BC from Aylesford in Kent. So in some ways, we shouldn't have been too surprised to see this, but I have to admit I was. But I think we can make a fairly good suggestion as to what these crests represent. And I think we're looking at fighting bird. And I just want to show you a few pictures uh, that the caveat emptor, I'm going to use images of pheasants that didn't reach Europe until much later, at least Western Europe until much later, but they make the point, I hope, very clearly. So I think our five foot three high man would have looked a lot taller with this on his head, and particularly if he was riding a horse. Now, there are a number of helmets with uh, birds represented on them. From Tintignac, there are examples, from examples shown on the, on the Gundestrup cauldron, but I couldn't resist a quick visit to Transylvania for my favorite, because this man, this uh, reenactor has got on his head a replica of a helmet found uh, to a grave a few centuries earlier than Lord Burstead, but the wings on this bird actually flap. They're really quite remarkable. And it's not to say that occasionally we don't have representations of birds in Britain. Here's the binding from a, another bucket that, like Aylesford, found a few years ago at Lenham. Now, this is Lenham's near Sittingbourne in Kent. And it has a really remarkable arrangement of two hippocamps, which are not very common in the art of the Iron Age, fighting over another beast. And at the rear, there is what looks to be a crane attacking the tail of the hippocamp. So we do see some remarkable creatures in Britain, but I don't think that is where we should be looking. I think instead we have a clue that comes from coins. I mentioned coins at the beginning, and most of the coins found in Britain at this time are gold. But Sussex is unusual, and it has a couple of coins made of different materials. Uh, there is silver and of bronze, and this is the only region around the Solent, between Hampshire and West Sussex, in which we can see what looks to be a trimetallic use of coinage, gold, silver, and bronze. In Kent, where many of those earlier gold coins have been found. Another coinage is you, the high tin bronze, but nothing quite like this. And these coins have very strong similarities to the ones in uh, the Seine Valley and in Normandy. One is known as Hampshire Thin Silver, and they're very, very thin, and they're almost cup shapes, fate and shape. And there's a very strong association between the side, both sides of the channel. 
The other one is what's known, the bronze coin, as a Chichester hot bronze. Now, I'm afraid I don't have a very good picture of it here. So this one, I hope, makes it clearer. And if you look carefully uh, at the tail side, you will see there is a bird. At the back, it's, it's wings and it's, its legs. At the top, it's beak. But underneath, there's a face. There's a human face. And the distribution of these coins is very firmly focused around Chichester. And it, although this map now is quite old, more recent finds uh, reported through the Port Antiquity Scheme give us more of the same. So it's very much a uh, West Sussex and Hampshire distribution. And what's interesting is that these coins copy ones that are made in the same valley and which are attributed to the tribe of the Belovaki. Now, whether it was actually the Belovaki or another tribe, I'm not sure, but here's an example of one of the original coins on the right, where again, you can see that essentially it's a helmet with a bird on top, the human face very clear, and then behind the man's cheeks are the two legs of the bird. So this is the prototype of the coin that was then copied in West Sussex and was called for obvious reasons, the Chichester Cock Bronze. So we've taken a look at the Great Book, the pottery, the weapons, the remarkable helmet, and then the coincidence of a helmet that is in an area that also has coins that show a man with a bird on his head. And this is where North Burstead sits in relation to the Belovaki. And as we move to a conclusion, I, I want to step back from the fine grain detail and look at the bigger historical context for a few moments. So the Belovaki are one of the tribes who uh, we know lived in the lower part of the, the same valley to the west of Paris. And Julius Caesar mentions them in the second year of his war for Gaul. Now he started that campaign in 58 BC and it runs for almost a decade. But in the second year, having fought against Helvetii, Switzerland and the people of central Gaul, he turns his attention to the people of the north. And there are three major battles in the summer. He starts off with the Belgae, and these are the people who he says live in northern France, and they form a coalition to fight against Caesar because they can see that they will lose their freedom. But they are defeated. He then moves on to Atratusi and then eventually to the Nervio. And there's a, a very painful ending to all of these battles. But what Caesar says about the coalition of the Belgae against him is that the Belovaki wanted to be the leaders of it. And so he wrote, amongst the Belgae, the Belovaki had redominant influence in war because of their courage, authority, and number of warriors. They demanded command of the campaign against Rome. Within a month or so, Viviacus, who's a Gaulish leader, reports to Caesar that the leaders of the Belovaki plot, perceiving how great a disaster they brought on the state, have fled to Britain. So it raises the question for me that we have a grave of a man wearing a headdress that copies coins of the Belovaki, and it has very strong connections in both the weapons and in some aspects of the funerary rites. Is this someone who fought against Caesar? Well, I will just finish by stepping back even further and looking at where we find graves with weapons. Now, these on this map, these dots represent burials dating pretty much to the late second century and first century BC. And you can see that there's a mass uh, around the Moselle um, and into Germany, but primarily in, in modern Germany and Luxembourg, a few in the Champagne area. 
And then there are quite a lot in the Lower Seine Valley. And in addition to that, we have a couple of burials near North Burstead, Oslebury, and St. Lawrence on the Isle of Wight, and then Kelvedon in Essex. So although uh, Tanya Panky Scheider didn't map England and Wales in this slide, there were not many to add. And what struck me through the course of last year when I was working on this was just the number of burials with weapons that there are in this part of the same valley. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge the assistance of French colleagues, Melanie Damaret and Quentin Sawyer, who helped me do this work through the pandemic. And it's quite remarkable how many there are. And it's interesting that some of these graves contain pieces of dismantled chariots as well. Now, of the 64 burials that I've been able to catalog, um, about a quarter of these date to the same time as a burial at North Burstead. And at least six, and maybe up to 10 of them, have the same sort of sword as was buried in the grave at North Burstead. So let's just summarize all of these points. If we look at what might have been made in Britain, what might have been made in Gaul, the helmet and the crest, the helmet is from Gaul, the crest is in a Gaulish style. I think it is made there. The sword and scabbard are found in both uh, Britain and in Gaul, but predominantly in Gaul. The shield is the same, the spear is, could be either. The chariots, or the, the, if I'm right in suggesting that we have the remains of a, a vehicle box, so that the carriage, is something that we see in Gaul at this time, but not in Britain. The pots could be either way, but the man with a high probability is an incomer from Gaul. And then if we turn to look at the rituals, almost all of the burials with weapons in Britain through the Iron Age are inhumation. But in Gaul, cremation is a dominant right. So if our man is a Gaul, his mourners buried him in a way that reflected what was typical of the right in Britain. The great majority of burials with weapons of Iron Age dates in Britain are undamaged. The, the objects are placed in the grave intact. But in Gaul, it is very common for the swords in particular to be buried. And it's clear that the sword at North Burstead, the spear, and also the helmet, where the crests have been deliberately taken off the helmet, have been dismantled. As I said, we don't see uh, vehicles in Britain at all, but we do see them in Gaul. But the pots again show the breakage of some of them, something that echoes what we see at West Hampton that's not far away. I think in these very simple slides, we can put together a, a case of a remarkable find, not just, as I said, in Britain, but across Western Europe, of a man who lived in dramatic times. So I started with a proposition and I've laid out, I think, very clearly, I hope, where I think this evidence leads us. So my question to conclude with, is this a man who did indeed fight against Caesar, if not with the Belovaki, but one of the other tribes who then fled in 57 BC to Britain and whose remains were then discovered almost 2000 years later in archeological excavation. And as my last image, the exhibition at the Novio is on show until November the 13th. So if you're able to get there, please do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was fantastic and uh, amazing images as well. Um, shall we take some questions from the room to start with? Andrew, could I thank you for oh. a terrific presentation? Uh, uh, I took great heart from that because I remember many years ago. Oh, I sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just have the microphone. Sorry. Well, thank you. I'll start again. Andrew, congratulations on a terrific presentation. Uh, I took great heart from that because. I remember many years ago when I suggested that the Iron Age warrior from Kelvin 
might have been directly involved in the Gallic Wars. I did so with great trepidation, but what you said today has given me great confidence, and I suspect I may not have been on the wrong lines. So, thank you. Uh, I have one uh, other observation, if I may. I was very struck at the decoration of this, this openwork bronze decoration on the helmet, and it made me think offhand of some of these openwork bronze plaques you get in places like the Somme Bayon chariot burial, and indeed at um, Danbury Hill Fort, <clears throat> wherever it is, Hampshire, I think it is. Danbury's still in Hampshire. Yeah. And I thought, I couldn't offhand think of anything that would link your helmet with these rather earlier openwork plaques. I don't know if you had any um, observations on that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Paul Seeley. Um, that Paul is right, that the openwork decoration is not something that we see very often at the end of the Iron Age. And when Paul talks about Sombion, a famous chariot burial um, in the Champagne, and uh, the plaque from Bainbury. Uh, uh, Hillfort, not that far from Winchester, they're going to be into the fifth and fourth centuries. And so when we see, so the only places where we see this style of openwork decoration that I can think of are on the, the, the Carnegie, the war trumpets, and on the four standards, and that certainly of first century BC date uh, in, in France. And that is pretty much it, apart from we zoom into Central Europe, there are a couple of open work parts from one of the opera, Czech opera, Stade Horisko, but they could be from something like the helmet, they could be from a carnix, they could be from a standard. So once, until this find, we'd have said those objects uh, would have been from a standard or a, a carnix. Now we can add the possibility they're from a helmet crest. So you need a lot to work it out. Thank you very much. Sorry, too close. Anyone else in the room like to ask a question? No? Yes? Gentleman there. Thank you. Yes, it, it, ter terrific. I, I love the Aylesford bucket. Uh, with the, the, um, the, the head with the, yes, with that, it looks very much like a helmet uh, the top decoration. Um, of course, the, the practical thing about something like this on a helmet is that you can be seen in the melee of battle. Your commander is visible and you can follow his leadership in, 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 in conflict. Yes, and the, it's clear that the, um, the helmet had been used. It's... Okay, it, it's clear that the helmet had seen uh, considerable use. Uh, the, there's evidence for repairs of the um, of the crests, which are just simply held on by rivets onto the mount. So it obviously been uh, used for real, not just a parade helmet. And I su suspect now uh, that we would probably, if we could start again, instead of having boar's bristles, which is what we put on the model for the museum display, I think I'd rather have feathers. Sorry, we just sorry. We'll take one, take one online first. Yeah. Sorry, come back to. You. Um, why do you think a ghoul coming to Britain would have had so uh, an elaborate funeral, and how long would he have been in Britain to gain such recognition in the perish before if he perished before invasion in fifty four slash fifty five BC? Okay, so there are a few questions there. Um, the, the first one to answer is it's the mourners who make the decision about how to bury this person. And if we're correct in the assumption that the objects buried with a person usually represent some of the accoutrements they had in life, this would suggest this person was a warrior, at least had the status of a warrior, and the remains of his bones would suggest that he did ride horses and he could wield a sword. So he would have been a leader, and the argument that I would put forward comes straight from Julius Caesar's own comment. It's the leaders who tried to go away so as not 
the, the purpose that they flee isn't, I don't think, for lack of courage, it's to avoid retribution on their people. And so by removing themselves from the scene, the chances of Caesar exercising what is often quite brutal and extensive punishment would be greatly reduced. As to when he died, he wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't think that he, we have to say he died before Julius Caesar, came, Julius Caesar came to Britain in his expeditions of 55 and 54. They're restricted to a very small part of the southeast of England, of Kent and then into Hertfordshire primarily. So he wouldn't, Julius Caesar's armies would not have come towards the Sussex coastal plain. But the reason ultimately that he was given such a well-furnished burial is because of the links that tied the people of Britain and Gaul, which are long-standing over many centuries. And that's why, if we think back to the gold coins right at the beginning of the talk, people did cross the channel to fight against Caesar, and some of them came back, and those coins were what they brought back with them. Thank you. Next answer. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, it's just a question about the shield boss, this very ultra thin metal. I mean, do you think as a decorative color cover over say a leather or some other material, or is it actually a symbolic object? Um, that it was that thin. I, the shield boss I think is a priest, is essentially it's parade armor. It's the very little practical use. Um, it's the same shape as the iron one and Sometimes we, we do see on where well, we have occasional remains of shields that we have either wood or a leather boss behind it, but it is decorative, it's not going to help. Um, it, they are so thin, and if it is indeed tinned, and we await the final results of the, the work at West Dean, that just is for show. And, and this is, it is really very, very showy, the whole thing. Uh, if you imagine, say, the figure on a horse with a helmet with a bird bird crest, perhaps a protome of a, a, a bird's head attached to it in some organic materials that we have no evidence for. It's for show. And he certainly wore the helmet because it's been repaired, but how much use it was in battle other than being a figurehead, I'm not sure. Is there another one here? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I have to confess to studying O-level Latin 60 years ago, and we were given Caesar's campaign to study. And I wondered then, and I still wonder, as a general context and background, to judge the number of fines that we've encountered, what size army or force would somebody like Caesar have had in those days to achieve what he was doing? Well, we can be fairly accurate for some parts of Caesar's force because we know how many legions he had and he raised extra ones. So he would have had an army of in the region of 30 to 35,000 legionaries. Uh, what he very rarely talks about are the allies, the auxiliaries. Um, and so for, if we, to give an example for Britain, when he comes on his second expedition, which is a serious um, exercise, the first one is primarily a show. It's like going to the moon and planting the flag by crossing the channel, by crossing the sea. But the second time, he would have had somewhere in five legions, so anywhere between, say, 20 to 24,000 legionaries. And he simply says, I brought half the cavalry who were Gaulish, 2,000 cavalry. But he makes no mention of whether he had specialist slingers, or archers, which we know at times he has in his campaign. But it, the numbers he has are impressive, but they're always much smaller than the Gauls. And the reason the Romans win pretty much all the time is because they're a professional army, they're trained, they're well equipped, and they're well supplied. Um, and the Gauls and the Britons don't have that. So the numbers of people who fought both in Britain and Gaul against Caesar are many, but the number of people who we, whose graves we found that we can suggest might be someone who fought Caesar are very, very small indeed. So my proposition is that sometimes we can find them. And my question 
is, is this one. Yeah, we've got a question uh, online, please. Um, they first they say thank you, and then given the helmet etc, do you think it is fanciful to think this man may be one of the leaders of the Belavashi who decamped to Britain rather than just one of the soldiers? Um, I think it's fanciful, but I think it's entirely probable. <laughs> um, we can't be sure, but I think it's, there are an awful lot of coincidences that we need to explain away in terms of the location of the burial, the date, the similarities, and the, the fact that the, the coins of the Belovaki and the coins in Chichester cock bronzes are so similar. And then we have a burial with a man with a, what I think is a, a bird on the crest. I think it's, there are too many coincidences, I think. I'd love to be able to be certain, but that's the nature of archeology. span and we've got a couple more. Um, did he die of natural causes? Insofar as we, we can tell, there are, there are no wounds that are obvious in terms of cut wounds, injuries like that. I say he survived various periods of illness as a child, as an adult. But the worst thing that seems to have happened to him was osteoarthritis in his upper back. OK, and the next one is um, when the Novium exhibition closes in November, what will happen to the objects? Will they be accessible for public viewing in the future? And if so, where? Indeed, they will be. It's a very good question. It's something I should have added at the end. Uh, the exhibition, uh, the Mystery Warrior exhibition, uh, runs until the middle of November. But shortly afterwards, uh, the finds will be transferred to the permanent displays in the museum. So they will be there uh, and accessible. Uh, I think probably from early December but not certainly in the new year. So there's a very short turnaround between the temporary exhibition finishing and the permanent display being uh, receiving the, the objects and perhaps the grave as well, the, the burial um, in December or January. Any more questions in the room? No, okay, thank you. Well, I must apologize as well, as I completely forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, in case anybody's wondering. I'm Heather. It's my great pleasure to thank Andrew again on behalf of the society, all the people online and all the people in the room for a fascinating insight <laughs> into these wonderful objects and uh, Caesar's movements from Gaul into Britain. So thank you very much. And shall we show our appreciation of that? Thank you, and if I could just make a couple more announcements before we finish. Our next lunchtime lecture is Tuesday the 2nd of November at one o'clock, The First Pharaohs of Egypt by Professor Aidan Dobson, FSA. And again, it will take place in person here and online as well. And if you'd like to attend, please book through our website. And our first in-person conference is this Saturday, the 9th of October, Experiencing Politics and Political Culture in Britain and Ireland from 1300 to 1815, organized by Dr. Laura Flanagan, Jan Caddick and Murray Tremellan. This is free to attend and again, will take place both here in person and online. And again, please book on our website. Our full autumn event program is live on our website and bookings are open. All our events are free and open to anyone to join. And I would encourage you all to sign up to Salon, our fortnightly e-newsletter which you, again, you can do through the website and you'll find information on upcoming events and the society and news from the heritage sector in general. So thank you again for coming. It's wonderful to see people in person and thank you to all of you online and hope to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>